Hi folks, welcome to our virtual event from Climate Solutions Momentum. I'm Stephanie Noren, the Communications Manager for Washington, and I'm so excited uh, to welcome you to be part of our event today. And to get us started, I'd like to welcome our board president, Jackie Dingfelder. Hi, Jackie. Hi, Stephanie. It's so great to see you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Jackie Dinkfelder, and I serve as board president for Climate Solutions. As we all know, climate change impacts are being felt nationwide, and any further delay in climate action will only make these impacts worse. I'm honored to serve as board president of Climate Solutions, where we are working to promote bold steps to avoid further climate catastrophe. It's exciting to be part of this event today as we have fabulous speakers who are working to build the new clean energy economy and address systemic inequities. We all know that climate solutions are not complete without addressing the current inequities in our systems. A big thanks to all of you for supporting climate solutions and our work. And I hope you enjoy today's program. Now back to you, Stephanie. Thanks, Jackie. It's great to see you. Uh, first, before we uh, start the program, we'd like everyone from wherever you are tuning in uh, to take a moment to acknowledge that we are all on Indigenous land. And if you don't know where you are, uh, you can do that now. We have some resources that you can uh, look up wherever you are. And we also encourage our viewers to just go beyond um, acknowledging where you are and learning about your area's original inhabitants and land stewards, um, and, but commit to action, like um, connecting to your local tribal communities, ensuring space at your decision-making tables, and supporting native-led priorities like land sovereignty, restoring treaty rights, and so much more. And we have a web page on our website, um, climatesolutions.org forward slash whose land. It has a number of resources that we encourage you to check out and learn more about a number of native led uh, issues and priorities. And we'll be live tweeting today at Climate Solution with the hashtag uh, Climate Momentum. Um, our event is so awesome. I am so excited and proud to share this with you. We're gonna wrap at 1.30 if you have to leave early, we'll, which you should stay for the whole thing. Um, we will send out the recording after the event and you can actually look at all of our recordings and you can binge watch your favorite climate leaders live or uh, check out anything after the show at um, climatesolutions.org forward slash events. And now I think we're ready to get started. And so we're gonna be, um, I'll be joined by Greg Small and Representative uh, Camilla Jayapal. Hey, Greg. Hey, hello everybody. Nice to see you. Um, my name is Greg Small. I'm the Executive Director of Climate Solutions. Representative Jayapal, welcome. It's been maybe two years since I've seen you probably since before COVID. So really good to see you. I hope you're doing well. Greg, it's so great to see you and so wonderful to be with everybody here at this really important uh, event for Climate Solutions. I'm just so grateful that you're headquartered right here in Seattle and uh, that I've been able to have the privilege of working with you all these years. Awesome. Well, I'm, I, I'm, I am, I think, a mile outside of your district. You are so close to being my representative, but I'm just outside of it. Um, but it is good to see you, and it has been probably a couple of years. And I guess I kind of want to start there. Um, I was thinking about the. I was thinking. Oddly, I'll just tell a quick thing. I, I remember sitting in um, the late Bill Ruckelhaus's office. Um, you know, the former EPA administrator, who of course was from Seattle. I remember him telling me about running for Congress in 1968 in Indiana, and thinking to myself, "Oh my goodness, what would it be like to be a member of Congress?" In historic times, and of course, you are a member of Congress in historic times. And I just wonder if you could just share a little bit about, you know, these last couple of years. Heck, the last couple of days have been so momentous. And just what's it like to be a member of Congress in times that are of, you know, this isn't the mid '90s. This is historic nature. And maybe let's just start there, and then we'll get into climate. Yeah, um, well, first of all, it's an incredible honor. You know, there are only 435 of us in the House of Representatives, and 
Uh, the seventh district chose to send the first South Asian American woman to the United States House. Um, and of course, being an immigrant, um, there's only about 18 of us in the Congress who were born outside of the United States and naturalized. And also, if you think about it, 86 women of color ever in the history of the country yeah. to serve in Congress. And so from all of those perspectives, I stand on great shoulders and I, and I seek to bring more people in that represent the diversity. But I got to be honest, it's been really tough. Um, it's been, it was a tough first four years. I was elected, as you might remember, on the same night that Donald Trump was elected. I do. And uh, so much of those four years were tumultuous, um, being an opposition party in the minority, pushing back on a Republican president who actually just sought to launch a coup against the United States government. And so um, I think you know it's been rough. And of course, the last two years with COVID have made it even harder with so much crisis, so many multiple crises at the same time, racial justice, um, climate crisis, economic crisis, health pandemic. Um, and so I think, you know, I take my solace from great organizing movements um, of the past and leaders of the past who get their strength in times of crisis and also recognize that these are moments, opportunities for us to refuse to give up um, at whatever barriers we face. I also have to say that, you know, when we turned out people across the country in states like Georgia and Arizona, um, people of color, young people who cared about the climate crisis, who cared about racial justice, who cared about immigrant rights, um, and saw the country's destruction under the last administration, we were able to get, yes, very, very slim majorities in the House, the Senate, and the White, and, you know, of course, taking over the presidency. But under this president, we have had a tremendous amount of progress and recovery. I mean, we first of all, we saw the previous administration rejected by the American people in electing President Biden. Maybe some people saw my my video when I was dancing on my front porch at that. I um, did see that. I remember seeing that. <laughs> <laughs> and we saw the American Rescue Plan passed and the boldest climate protection bill in history at least passed through the House of Representatives and with 99% of Democrats um, on board. So yes, these years have been tumultuous, but I think, honestly, I just feel like they have strengthened our resolve to fight back, to um, restore our country's democracy and our democratic institutions. And of course, that's what we're facing over the last um, less than 48 hours with this new assault on women's reproductive freedoms, which yeah. we are not going to take sitting down. No, for sure. And I want to get back to, we'll get back to organizing and how we kind of continue to build our movement a little bit. But I mean, let's talk to climate. I mean, I've known you, I've known you for a long time. I know how committed you are on climate, but you know, why, why is climate change important to you? You know, um, it is not an isolated issue. We talk about climate change, you know, sometimes people talk about it as if it's just one thing, but it affects everything in our lives from poverty to health to migration, um, the water we drink, the air we breathe, um, the places we go to ground ourselves in the beauty of what is around us. It is really, I think for me, I've always been an intersectional person. You probably yeah. heard me say that before, you know, I'm not a woman on Monday, a mom on Tuesday, an immigrant on Wednesday, a worker on Thursday. I'm all of those things all of the time. Yeah. And to me, climate change is the ultimate intersectional issue that um, affects everything in our lives. And so, you know, I, I think here in the Pacific Northwest as well, um, we're seeing kind of the devastating and widespread effects. And uh, just a, a couple of weeks ago, I've been getting briefed by um, some of the scientists on the front lines of studying sea level rise um, on our coast. I've gotten briefed by the firefighters leading the work to control the wild, wildfires that are, are just sweeping through our state every summer. And um, of course, my work on racial justice has shown me over and over again that the effects of climate change are most severe for our most vulnerable populations, for our communities of color and our low-income communities. Um, and so it, it's, it's been a top priority for me um, since before I got to Congress, but certainly in Congress, really trying to lead on 
um, being the boldest we possibly can on the urgency of this crisis. Yeah, well, let's talk about the urgency and let's talk about Congress and climate. I mean, I know you've been involved in a lot of bills. I mean, you were on the front page of the papers every day for quite some time around, I don't know, that was probably six months ago or, or so when Build Back Better was, you know, uh, front and center. I know you recently introduced the Climate Resilience Workforce Act. There's other bills. I mean, can you talk a little bit about sort of what's the, what, what are your priorities in Congress and, and sort of just what's the state of play around climate change uh, in, in Congress as we're sort of nearing the end of this particular uh, session as we head into the elections? Yeah, I mean, I think that my priority is really, you know, how do we remove the root causes of climate change? Um, including fossil fuels and emissions, and how do we transition to a clean energy economy? And um, if if I think about it, you know, it's sort of like jobs, justice, and decarbonization, right? So how do we um, make sure that we're uh, putting an end to toxic fracking, to deep water drilling? But how do we create an environment where um, all communities can thrive and be healthy? And so it's a it's a big uh, um, the Congressional Progressive Caucus, which I have the great honor of chairing, we have 98 members, yeah. um, we put forward several years ago our uh, sort of climate action plan, and a lot of that plan is what has been incorporated into the Build Back Better bill, um, and actually into the better versions before, it, before we even got to Build Back Better, because right. some of the things that we were pushing for, we couldn't get um, we couldn't get the votes in the in the House and the Senate. But I think that, you know, when I think about this, um, I'm thinking about all three of those things. And if you look at my Climate Resilience Workforce Act, I think that's what I've really tried to do is how do we focus on jobs? How do we focus on decarbonization? And how do we focus on um, justice? And part of that transition is investments in, in solar and wind power and all of the developments of next generation technologies that that will curb our greenhouse gas emissions but also part of it is this just transition you know how can we address the fact that we have a lot of workers greg across this country whose only job is in fossil fuels and yeah. when we replace those jobs they've got to be jobs that can be in those communities and um it can't just be overall number of jobs we've actually got to address the issues that people are facing as they as they face losing their jobs. And these are some of the most um, vulnerable workers also. They are frontline also in the same way that our black and brown and indigenous communities yeah. are frontline. So that's why I've been trying to focus also on job training and job creation programs um, and minimum labor standards like I like I have in the Climate Resilience Workforce Act. But I have a lot of hope that we've made enormous progress on the overall understanding of what it is we need to do. We may not have the votes that we need in yeah. the House and the Senate, but we do have more than I've ever seen before um, an understanding of what it is we need to do and the urgency to act. It's just not, we, we, we just, we still need to do more to get the votes that we need. Yeah, um, and I, I'm, I won't spend too much time talking about the senior senator from West Virginia that I'm sure you spent a lot of time on. But I did want to come back to a point that I thought that was really important. It's like, it's like Voldemort, Greg. He will not be named. <laughs> um, to be sure, to be sure. Um, you know, the issue of jobs, and I, I think for a long time in the climate movement, we have made, I think, a, a an argument that there are more jobs in solar and wind and and everything else than there are in fossil fuel industries and that 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 spin wheel is going to only move faster i think we have been attacked and i'm sure you've heard this is not being as focused on making sure that those jobs as you just mentioned are actually in the communities where fossil fuel workers actually are working right now because that's where they need the jobs they're not going to move from west virginia to arizona to work on solar in most cases i wonder you know you started to talk about that already but what are those conversations like in Congress? It, it, it seems like that's an area where there'd be support. And um, I know everything gets all mashed together and there's no single bill, everything gets mashed together. So it's hard, but do you feel traction on that particular topic when you talk to your colleagues? I do. And I think the labor movement has, um, has also been making some great strides as has the environmental movement, right? Like we both, 
we kind of have to move all of us together yeah. again after being ripped apart. And certainly I know that happened here in the state with our climate initiative and some of the discussions we've been having. But I think that we've got we've had some great labor leaders who have said, yes, we understand what we need to do. And we also, for example, when I was putting together my climate resilience bill, we really made an effort to reach out to labor, including building trades folks um, around how we should structure it, because yeah. we do need to think about these jobs in multiple ways. And when we say just transition, unfortunately, sometimes um, I think there are some of our workers and folks in labor who, who hear that and think it's just a shorthand way for saying, we're not really gonna care about where right. these jobs are. And, and right. also the other thing is, and we've seen this in our state, in Washington state, where some of those solar jobs that did come in were not good union jobs. And so we also need to make sure that as we're creating these renewable energy jobs, that they are, um, that they are good high wage um, union jobs and that we're not contributing to the deunionization of um, of our manufacturing base. And so I think there are a number of considerations there, but I think it all starts with talking to each other and hearing each other about what the challenges are and, and asking people to, to bring them in. You know, maybe you can't get to the place where you're endorsing a bill right. yet, but maybe yeah. we can make some steps forward on at least working together to put some provisions in so that you're not opposing a bill actively. And right. hopefully that will get us to a place where we will be able to um, build the support we need on the jobs front. And, you know, and I think just really recognizing that these, these workers who have been doing these fossil fuel jobs, they, I mean, they have health problems, they have all kinds of issues. And I think it was really significant when Cecil Richards, the mine workers president in West Virginia came out yeah. in support of passing Build Back Better. I mean, I Me think too. that was a huge, huge deal. And yes, Build Back Better provisions were, were narrowed from what we had originally hoped, um, but they are still significant. I mean, a half a trillion dollar investment into taking on climate change and a lot of it in, you know, in really pushing a renewable energy transition, but also um, a, climate res uh, a climate workforce, a climate civilian climate core, um, things like that, that I think will inspire young people across the country to go back out and work on these projects in our public lands and really um, contribute to the to the rebuilding of our our planet and of our people. Yeah, there is so much to like. All right, I want to shift gears a little bit and talk about something that I think you are so excellent at, which is communications. I find you to be perhaps an effective communicator I've seen in a very very long time, and the reason I believe that to be true is because you're so good at talking about things in ways that bring people in, adding bringing more people into the movement on whatever topic you're talking about. I think I'm very passionate about the importance of communications on climate change. I think we have a lot of work to do to improve it. And I just wonder how you think about communicating around this issue and how you think about using communications on climate change to bring people in and, and build a broader movement um, and not, not make us smaller, but make us bigger and, and broader. Well, that's very nice of you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I, you know, I'm an organizer, right? And yeah. so I'm used to talking to people about what affects their everyday lives. And I think that a lot of people in elected office overall, but certainly in Congress, um, talk at this level. They're up right. here, you know, and they're not talking about what is the impact to your everyday life. And I remember, oh gosh, it's probably been 15 years ago now that um, I did a training for an environmental organization who was trying to figure out how to bring more people of color into their volunteer ranks. And I remember um, saying, okay, I want you to draw two pictures for me. I want you to draw, one, draw one picture of what you say your mission is and what you're trying to accomplish. And then I want you to draw one picture of what you say people say to you their top priority is when they walk in the door or when you encounter them and you're trying to recruit them as volunteers. Right. And it was so interesting because 
the one picture back then was kind of about this beautiful picture of the planet and mountains and snow-capped mountains and right. you know gorgeous oceans with orcas swimming through and and then the other picture for folks of color was um you know factories like i remember very specifically factories that were uh putting toxic fumes out into the air kids not being able to breathe and so I think it's really, and then I had them just put those pictures together and say, okay, how do you, right. how do so you talk to people in a way that answers their everyday concerns? And so I think that's the thing that we have to do. And the great thing is I do feel like we've made so much progress on this and that people are talking about the air we breathe, about lead in waters as an environmental justice issue. You know, I started a task force in Congress um, the Task Force for Environmental Justice that with my colleagues, Nanette Barragan and Don McEachin from the Black Caucus, the Hispanic Caucus, and me, of course, from the Asian American, Asian Pacific American Caucus. That's what I think we have to do. We have to look at what people are saying their concerns are today yeah. and answer them in that way that, and I've, I've been using Planet and Our People because it really is it's all it's all together it goes back to your first question you know it's yeah. about the intersectionality so what are we going to do for people that's going to improve their life and livelihood today how do people wake up feeling better about their opportunities and their futures because of something we're doing today that's how i try to communicate to people so on built back better it was money in your pockets shots and arms you know that was our um, mantra and in, in um, sorry, that was the American Rescue Plan and in Build Back Better, you know, really talking about um, how we're going to uh, improve the air that people breathe, how we're going to make sure that everyone's got clean drinking water, how we protect the public spaces that allow our kids to play. Um, and, you know, and then of course the indigenous movement of tribal leaders has been so important to giving us the history of preservation as it relates to life and living in a particular area. Um, so that's that's how I try to think about it. How's it gonna affect your everyday life? And how do I talk to you about it from that place? Yeah, I, I, I agree with that completely. I think we have this incredible opportunity right now because there's, I mean, obviously Build Back Better or whatever form may or may not pass, but we did pass the bipartisan infrastructure package here in Washington State, where both of us are from, uh, we've passed incredible bills. We have a lot of money coming in from public sources, again, from the federal bill and the state bill. The thing I've been talking a lot about is how this money has the opportunity to really transform people's lives, not at the level of like 1.5 degrees, 2 degrees, at the level of like, there's now an electric bus that's going through my neighborhood instead of well, diesel spewing bus. And that's going to make the air quality where I live and where I breathe much better. So we just have all these opportunities now with the, with the, the funding coming in to start to transform, as you said, actual experience of real people's lives. Now, of course, at the same time, we're going to be cutting carbon emissions, which is really critical on climate. But if we can do both of those things at the same time, which I think we have this opportunity, that really excites me. And that's why I think public policy is so critical and investments are so critical. And I wonder if you, you know, I think you agree with that, but I wonder what your thoughts are about how do we effectively, as we start to have more policies in place, as we start to have more investment dollars, how do we think about using that as an organizing vehicle again to just bring more people in? Well, that's what's so exciting about this. And I'm glad you mentioned the bipartisan infrastructure. And, you know, I just have to say, like, my 30 minute, 30 second spiel on this is we had the slimmest majorities in the history, recent history of our country. Yeah. And I know how frustrating that is for everybody. But even with those slim majorities, look at how we have done so much with just that slim majority. And, you know, it's the American Rescue Plan, it's cutting hunger by 32%, it's cutting. Um, child poverty by 40%. It's bringing unemployment down to the lowest level in over half a century. But it's also these investments that we've made. The bipartisan infrastructure package 
Um, I know just the state of Washington, I, I know you have some folks from Oregon, including my fabulous sister, who is a <laughs> Multnomah County Commissioner, Sushila Jayapal. Sorry, I had to get that in. Um, and she, she's on with us too. But I know that in Washington state, we have about $8 billion that's coming to Washington state. And that's just in the top line, right? There's also all these other grants that are providing for the state legislature now to have passed um, a really important investment in electric vehicles. I mean, yeah. this is the electric vehicle charging system um, is part of the bipartisan infrastructure bill. All of these investments are gonna be huge opportunities for organizing in communities. And you do need to make sure you're organizing for environmental justice. Because unfortunately, the, the bill that we passed was not the bill that the House drafted, which would have actually changed some core pieces of, of um, the way we make grants, for example, to prioritize environmental justice communities. There is a commitment to environmental justice from the administration, from Mitch Landrew and from others who are charged with this task, but it will require the state and communities to work together to make sure that 40% of our investments go to the to communities that are most disproportionately affected. It also frees up a lot of funds for states to be able to do yeah. really innovative projects. And um, I'm always, you know, our, our, we have a fantastic governor, obviously, here in, in Washington do. State, climate, the most climate friendly governor in the country, um, and a great state legislature now, unlike when I was there, when I was in the minority, I not know. the case today. I know. But those folks are doing really great stuff. And I do want people to remember that these investments were made possible by the federal government. There's a lot of money that's flowed, a lot of opportunity for communities to organize and to push different kinds of models for how these dollars are used that um, will actually move, our, uh, move us forward um, on climate change and on climate justice. Awesome. Well, we're just about time. Um, I guess... Look, I just want to say thank you. You are a huge inspiration to me. You're a huge inspiration to, I know, many people. I hope there's, you know, there's, I think there were 650 or so people who registered. I hope that you are inspired by all of us because we're going to, we're going to keep at this thing. We're obviously, uh, the journey continues, but I just can't thank you enough for all that you're doing, Representative Jayapal. Uh, and it's a pleasure working with you and I uh, look forward to more coming soon. So thank you very much. Greg, I'm so honored to have had this opportunity to chat with you and so grateful for everything you do. And let's just remember as organizers, strength comes in moments of crisis. Yeah. We are growing our progressive movement for climate justice and you are very much such an integral part of leading that charge. Awesome, thank you. Talk soon. Thank you. Bye. Thanks, Greg, for that introduction and your leadership. Uh, it is my honor and great pleasure to introduce Deputy National Climate Advisor Ali Zaidi. Uh, in his role as Deputy Advisor and Deputy Assistant to the President, Ali Zaidi helps lead the White House Climate Policy Office, which is responsible for coordinating the policymaking process on domestic climate issues and monitoring implementation of the President's cl uh, domestic climate policy agenda. A longtime advisor to President Biden on climate matters, Deputy Advisor Zadie brings the cross-sector and multidisciplinary experience needed to deliver a whole-of-government response to the climate crisis. On a personal note, I worked with Ali when we worked together in the Obama White House. I would say that I mentored him, but it was most certainly the other way around, notwithstanding my gray hair, although I see he has some now too. Uh, beyond my personal pride in seeing a South Asian American helping to lead the American response to our shared global climate crisis. Ali's intellect, generosity, integrity, and humility make him a great colleague, and I sorely miss working with him. He embodies the type of leader you want in the hardest roles in government service. Welcome, Deputy Advisor Zaidi. Thank you, uh, and uh, all of that, um, all of that is, is far too generous, and I'm, I'm just really grateful to be here with you and, and with, with this entire crew of folks committed to building uh, momentum uh, behind the climate solutions that we need at this moment of crisis. Um, you know, a weird place to start, but, but you know, the, the, 
um, equation uh, that defines momentum is, is mass times velocity. And uh, I think as we think about what it means to really grow uh, the momentum here, we've got to think about it in that same way. How do we broaden the number of folks who are coming with us for the journey? Um, if we travel alone, uh, we will not meet the moment. Uh, and then how do we accelerate uh, uh, the pace of progress? You know, what's, what's remarkable to me, and, and Garb mentioned uh, that we served together uh, in the previous Democratic administration, is how much things have changed in just the last few years. Um, you know, there was a time when we talked about green jobs and they felt like they were either, you know, an idea in a book or, or jobs maybe that people do on another planet. Um, today, those are the jobs folks are doing in our communities right now. Um, it's those same electricians who have wired our country um, that are now helping us rewire it, uh, helping us install those charging stations. The president has secured enough funding to build a nationwide network of charging stations, 500,000 from coast to coast. It's those same plumbers and pipe fitters we've relied on uh, uh, as a central um, uh, central workforce in building out our infrastructure that are now helping remove um, the lead pipes and, and, and put in place the infrastructure for things like clean hydrogen uh, that are going to be necessary for us to decarbonize really hard uh, to abate sectors like industry. Um, you know, it's, it's, the, it's the steel workers who um, helped us come into the industrial age who are now um, helping us uh, take our imaginations um, in terms of things like offshore wind and turn them into reality. And, you know, just to, I think for me, um, very much central to the way uh, we've tried to do work in this administration with President Biden out front leading by example is really to meet people where they are. And, and I, th I can't think of a better example of that than the auto sector, where we came into this administration, um, the fuel economy standards, the tailpipe emission standards that we've come to rely on to take the gunk out of the atmosphere and uh, help save costs for consumers had been gutted. Uh, they had been reversed and rolled back. And industry had, had fallen behind. Uh, our our uh, autos were not necessarily leading this transformation um, that we're seeing. And I think there was an anxiety amongst uh, the workers who've made uh, America's auto industry so strong about their role in the future of uh, the automotive sector. And I remember going with the president to Dearborn um, and visiting the Ford facility there. And we've got, you know, all of these United Auto Worker members there. Uh, and if you know anything about the UAW, it is one of the most diverse unions uh, we've got. Um, and it's, it's really been a force for building out the middle class in black and brown communities all across the country, not just in, in Michigan. And the president heard them out, heard their anxieties. Uh, and, and what he heard was this transition is gonna work if we try to bring the whole supply chain here in the United States. If the batteries are made somewhere else, if the powertrain for these electric vehicles are made somewhere else, we're not gonna be able to reap that sort of economic benefit that's gonna help retain these critical jobs that have supported our middle class. So when we brought together folks around a 50% uh, electric vehicle goal for 2030, uh, standing in the South Lawn of the White House in August, 2021, we had uh, the UAW uh, standing with the president and we had the American auto sector. Everyone had come together because we met them where they are. And I, you know, um, I know this is a little, little bit of a tangent, but you know, people often say, well, why are, why are you talking about gas prices? Uh, why aren't you just talking about electric vehicles? Um, 
And the reality is the car that, you know, someone's got parked at the end of the driveway right now is the car that they're probably going to have parked at the end of the driveway tomorrow. Um, and so the president has taken action to attack uh, this uh, price hike that we're seeing because of the Russia-Ukraine situation uh, and Putin's aggression, while at the same time accelerating the, the measures that we need to make affordable and accessible the shift to electric and hydrogen vehicles. You know, economists call that in the short run, uh, demand is fairly inelastic. Um, that's the wonky term for it. Uh, but the I think the real life version of that is you got to meet people where they are. So anyway, uh, that's sorry to digress there. Um, uh, eager to get into a, a little bit more of a conversation, but just two things that I want to note about the way we've been going about climate action in the administration. The first is we recognize that we need to go sector by sector, segment by segment, and have a strategy for each component of our economy. Um, it's very easy to say, well, power plants are a really big deal. Let's focus most of our energy in power plants. Well, there may be really easy wins in the power sector, but as a result, you might miss out on a ton of opportunity in industry, in steel, cement, in the building materials. And so we've really been focused on, you know, buildings, transportation, power sector, industry, which people used to call hard to abate. Um, we've now got strategies on steel and cement and aluminum that are actually paying dividends. Uh, and then the second thing is to recognize um, the, the intersections uh, between climate work and public policy and progressive public policy more broadly. Um, this is our opportunity, if we do it right, to help people move into the middle class. This is our opportunity to reach communities that are so often left out and left behind, places that have uh, suffered under the sort of uh, oppression of legacy pollution and cumulative impacts. Um, so in everything we do, we string in a focus on high road and good jobs, uh, a focus on environmental and climate justice, uh, a focus on uh, resilience of communities and regional economic development. So that's my sort of general pitch to, to folks, whether it's at the federal level or the state or the local, uh, or you're pushing companies for action, um, don't be relentless about progress in every sector and be relentless about pursuing the breadth of the values because we have a real big opportunity here uh, embedded in this crisis. That's great. Uh, Deputy Advisor Zadie, thanks so much for those opening remarks. Uh, we know you're quite busy and you're gonna have to leave us soon. So we have about five minutes. Uh, to answer a couple of questions, if that sounds good. Um, yeah. So let me let me dive in here. First, we have a large audience with us today. Thank you to all of, all of you online uh, following along. Uh, that audience is super motivated um, and can help uh, in a number of ways get the word out about climate solutions that are available right now. Can you talk a little bit about opportunities and success stories that not enough people know about? Well, first of all, and I, you know, I wouldn't be doing my job if I didn't plug this. I, I would love for folks to go to whitehouse.gov slash climate. Um, that's whitehouse.gov slash climate. And the first thing you'll see is a set of six actions you can take right away. Um, the first, and, and Representative Jayapal was talking about the bipartisan infrastructure law, uh, which has resources around clean energy and cleaning up pollution. Um, we've got a, a whole toolkit for how you can help harness the bipartisan infrastructure law for progress in your community. Um, the second is you can help us get your community to join the President's Building Performance Standard Coalition. Now, the building sector has been very, very hard to decarbonize uh, because you got to make a ton of improvements. Um, you're very reliant, obviously, on a lot of exogenous uh, emissions from the grid. And so uh, one of the things we've seen, the difference between a building code and a building performance standard is building code is for obviously new buildings. 
performance standards, how we're going to reduce the emissions on existing. We've got 30 states and cities signed up. You can get your community signed up for that. The third is we put together this whole toolkit for how to get schools retrofitted and electrified uh, and get those yellow school buses to no longer be a source of pollution for kids, but rather be a source of clean energy. Uh, we've got that toolkit online and you can take that to your school uh, or your school board, encourage them to apply and take advantage of the resources. The fourth, and I know folks in the, in the Pacific Northwest are certainly doing this, is accelerating uh, community solar and rooftop solar uh, and storage projects in your communities. We've got a bunch of tools that we've aggregated um, uh, to boost solar power in your communities. Um, and then finally, the thing I wanna uh, flag is um, we want, we're looking for talent. Uh, <laughs> I know not everyone wants to move from the the, the lush verdant Washington to the swampy Washington. Um, so, you know, uh, it's different different uh, things for different people, but we are hiring a clean energy core at the Department of Energy. And we'd love for you to think about uh, bringing your talents to the federal government in this moment of transformation. That's great. Just so just quickly to recap, whitehouse.gov slash climate um we just Ali, we just call it the other washington here we don't call it swampy um so, uh, so everyone's so nice <laughs> uh so if folks are interested uh in, in taking their skills uh to the east coast uh you heard from deputy advisor zadie about that and it sounds like uh there's so much people can do whether it's contacting their school boards uh focusing on building performance standards and so forth so thank you for those very actionable uh steps um, if we can, we have about two minutes. Let's just try to hit this one quickly. As you know, um, Washington, and Oregon have passed some fabulous state level policies in recent years. Other states have two Colorado, Illinois, New York, where you previously served, I believe, as Deputy Secretary yeah. for Energy and Environment. Can you talk a little bit about the role states have to play right now on climate? It's, you know, it, in, in trying to, to get where we need to go, we just need to figure out ways to go faster and faster. Um, and states are going to have comparative advantage moving faster on certain things. Um, the, the building uh, sector, for example, is regulated at the state and local level. Um, so that's going to be a place where there's definitely going to be more opportunity at the state and local level. Um, you know, I think one of the one of the big things that we need to do uh, is help people in our communities see themselves in the solutions. Um, and that's a thing that you know, the president's going to use his bully pulpit to help shine the light on the opportunity. But I think the biggest thing that folks can do is help spread that word. Uh, we've got so many reasons to be feeling doom and despair, um, but we've got to find a way to see optimism and opportunity. It's not a closed door. It's one that we can open uh, and we can walk through and there are jobs and there's justice on the other side. Um, so spread the good word, uh, hold your leaders accountable, um, chase relentlessly opportunities in every sector of the economy, uh, pursue all of those uh, opportunities for progress, not just on climate, but all of the things we care about, um, and, and hold folks like, uh, like us accountable. Um, you know, we've got uh, a lot of commitments we've made, and, and we're going to work really hard to follow through on them. That's great. Thank you for that positive uh, note to conclude on. Uh, we know you're very busy. Uh, thank you so much, Deputy Advisor Zadie, for the conversation today. It's great to see you again. Look forward to visiting yeah. DC. Thanks for sharing your insights today with all of us in our community today. Thank you so much. Well, we have a great panel coming up. Uh, looking forward to that. I'd, I'd now like to introduce my friend and colleague, Savita Redipati, Deputy Director of Climate Solutions. Savita, take it away. Thank you so much, Garab, and thank you for all that you do as a CS board member. And thank you, Representative Jayapal, for being here today, especially with everything going on right now with reproductive health in our country. And Deputy Advisor Zaidi, thank you for all that you're doing in DC and for sharing your inspiration and expertise with Climate Solutions and our Momentum events. And and actually like sharing with us about the definition of momentum in your remarks, that was, that was really great. 
I'm only a little intimidated to give remarks right now after not one, but two people who work directly with President Obama. Um, and hi, thanks to all of you who are here today. May the fourth be with you. I'm Savitha Reddy Pathy, and I have worked on climate, the biggest justice issue of our lifetimes for 25 years. Over 12 of those years have been at Climate Solutions, where I've seen that we are undoubtedly helping lead the way on climate action. Climate Solutions is focused on mission critical work at the state and local levels, because the progress that we make here has an impact that goes far beyond our region. As you just heard, we're seeing solutions everywhere, from government to business to activists and the nonprofit community. Here in Washington and Oregon, the last few years have been a time of incredible progress. We've passed groundbreaking policies that have firmly established this region as a national leader in climate policy. Legislators passed these policies, not only because they're good ideas, they also did this because people like you called for these changes. Only two Fridays ago, Washington passed a new statewide commercial and multifamily building energy code that will be the strongest, most climate friendly in the country by driving the transition to requiring electric heat pumps for space and water heating. Our fastest growing source of climate pollution is using fossil gas to power our buildings. And that is why our event today has an all-star panel focused on building electrification and the built environment. 2022 is critical and consequential to address the climate crisis. There is momentum now for truly transformative climate solutions and at the scale that is needed. We know that historic pollution is in our atmosphere and that more impacts in the coming years and months are all but inevitable. Even if we don't look up, the science and trends are overwhelming. While the scale of the crisis is huge and the timeline for action is short, many of the solutions and technology already exist and more investments are coming. A rapid transition is not only feasible, but also is well underway, shifting away from fossil fuels and towards building new ways to power our economy with clean energy. What stands in the way is the status quo and overcoming this is the decisive work of our decade. So when I question my resolve, I still feel hope about climate action in this momentum. Why? Because of the work of Climate Solutions and our partners and the movement that we continue to build together. Earlier this year, we adopted a new strategic plan with four priorities. One, pass, implement, and share the success of groundbreaking policies. Two, strengthen collaborative partnerships, deepen storytelling, and align for greater power building. Three, identify and foster innovations across the public and private spectrum in our region. And four, invest in thriving organizational health. We are in a new era. The core challenge of this new era is to turn our policy wins into progress on the ground. It's not enough to only pass good laws. We also must make sure that our leaders and agencies implement new policies equitably and inclusively so that people and communities, especially people of color and those who have been first and worst impacted and least responsible for climate change, experience tangible, broadly shared benefits and our states achieve their desired goals. What will success look like as we transition from fossil fuels to clean energy across all sectors? Good family wage jobs. Buildings where we live, work, play, and learn are powered by clean electricity instead of by fossil gas. Everyone having access to affordable electric vehicles and electric mobility options, including public charging, especially in underinvested communities. More homegrown clean energy like wind and solar is what Deputy Advisor Zadie just mentioned too. Clean electric vehicles replacing dirty diesel buses and trucks, especially in communities with the worst air quality increase in affordable transit options for all, especially for those that rely on them the most. Research and development that can accelerate newly emerging technologies, stories that show that the transition to clean energy is coming soon to everyone's communities and that it's affordable and accessible for all. Real and noticeable health and economic benefits, especially for people of color and low income and rural communities. Your support will help climate solutions implement and protect the policies that we've helped pass in Oregon and Washington, like clean fuel standards and 100% clean electricity. Continue to work with partners existing in future and to connect with all of you to engage on climate action and just transition and electrify our buildings. It's why I'm so excited for our panel conversation in a few minutes with Donnell, Patience, Deepa, and Ash.
Your support will also help Climate Solutions to collaborate and innovate on new ideas and to support and strengthen our amazing team. Fossil fuel pollution is not going to go away without a fight. We need to protect all that we have accomplished and we need to move much faster and further on climate action. In the words of MLK Jr., it really is the fierce urgency of now. There is more work to do and we could not do it without all of you. Thank you so much for being here today and for your support of Climate Solutions. Now it's my honor to turn things over to Ash Awad, Climate Solutions Board Vice President and President and Chief Market Officer at McKinstry. Ash, please take it away. Thank you. Well, Savitha, holy crow. I love that. <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm I I was jazzed up listening to the others speak, but oh my goodness, that was absolutely fantastic. We are just so fortunate to have you and that really thoughtful update uh, provided. So thank you, and I again want to thank Representative Jayapal, Deputy Advisors Aidi, Greg, and Gorab for those thought-provoking conversations. I think we could have actually between Sabita and. Um, our guests, we could have probably spent another hour or more listening to those wonderful folks. And, you know, in a few minutes, we're going to have more fantastic folks sharing their perspective, particularly on the built environment. We've got a fantastic panel um, that I'm going to introduce in a moment. But hey, first, help me do this, okay? Let's act on supporting climate solutions. Today's about building momentum as we accelerate the transition to clean energy for all. And, you know, uh, as we raise $100,000, that's got to be a typo. I mean, it seems too low for such an organization. It must be a mistake. Okay, look, let's try to raise $200,000 today for climate solutions. You know, let's take a moment first to thank our sponsors, someone like me that works in the business community, and especially like to thank our climate leaders for their support and partnership for this event and, and actually even past events. Clean Fuels Alliance America, Microsoft, and the Port of Seattle. Thank you so much. We also had many other sponsors that I'd like to thank. I think some of them should be popping up on your screen. you be able to see all the logos and all those that have supported getting this event put together. And of course, thank you all, each and every single one of you for attending and being part of this event. And I'm, I'm really hopeful that you're going to join me in contributing to Climate Solutions I've been a huge fan of Climate Solutions for a very, very, very long time. You know, their vision of a thriving, equitable Northwest that actually has an impact both nationally and, in my opinion, globally has just been outstanding. I really love the people at Climate Solutions because of their passion, their motivation. I mean, dare I say it's infectious. You heard Savitha. I mean, it was just amazing to hear her, and it got me actually even further jazzed up about the things that we must do together to solve for these big monumental problems. You know, my time with each of these folks that are Climate Solutions has been instrumental in the way I, and actually we at McKinstry, have informed our own strategic long-term plans, as well as our practical and actionable solutions almost at a day-to-day -day basis. So Climate Solutions is not only setting policies, but you're also doing things to help guide us through everyday solutions that make sense. Thank you, Greg, Savitha, and the entire Climate Solutions team. And today we can invest all together to continue to build our clean energy future. I'd like you to help me raise this $200,000 for Climate Solutions and our work to accelerate a clean energy solutions to the climate crisis. As you heard from Savitha, your donation is gonna do many things. I've got a summary for you though, just in case. You know, we've passed policies, but we've got to protect those policies. We've got to create rules around those policies. We've got to make sure that the policies aren't just uh, codified, but they're actually formed in a way that they can be acted upon. We need to absolutely ensure a just transition. We've got to electrify our built environment, completely decarbonize the built environment. It's going to take a village. It's going to take us working together to collaborate and innovate new ideas. And Climate Solutions is wonderful at bringing teams of people and different organizations together. And of course, we've got to support this amazing team that's doing such great, great work to advance uh, such important topics for us, both locally and in my opinion, globally. Hundreds of you watching right now, and I'm hoping that you're all going to take a moment to uh, donate. I hope that you're inspired and that you're going to help build this momentum to a climate uh, 
this climate movement momentum that we've got. By the way, if there's someone you're inspired by and you would like to make a tribute gift, you can actually also do that or uh, donate in the name of a loved one. Every gift matters, moves our critical work forward. You know, it doesn't matter 25, 100, 350 or more or less. Whatever makes sense, you can give online through Climate Solutions donation link. I think it's on the screen also. And I want you to know that if you'd like to increase your giving, we would not say no. You can do it monthly donation. Uh, that's an option. Uh, you can also give by donating stock. For instance, uh, if you want to donate all of your Twitter stock so that we can sell it immediately uh, and rid us all of that uh, stock, that we can do that for you. So let us know. I want you to want you to know we really appreciate your support of Climate Solutions. And I presume at this point, based on both uh, Savita's inspiring words, Representative Jayapal, uh, Deputy Advisor, Saidi, all of those inspirations that right now, everyone, 100% of you have contributed. If not, we can stay here all day until we get 100% contribution. I'm just kidding, we probably couldn't stay here all day. So instead, what I'm gonna do is keep the inspiration alive. Here's what I'd like to do. I would like to introduce our panelists briefly, and then in a moment, I'm going to leave each of them to kind of share some of their own personal experiences and their specific roles. So with that being said, we've got our panelists joining us right now, and I'd like to welcome you, Patience. Patience is the Executive Director of the Housing Development Consortium. And Deepa, you're with Climate Solutions as the Washington Clean Buildings Policy Manager. Welcome. Good to see you both. Thank you, Ash. Thank you for having me. Really excited to be here. Yeah, thank you, Ash. And, and thank you, Patience. I'm really excited for this discussion today. Yeah, Deepa, I'm with you. I'm, I'm super excited to hear from both of you specifically. So thank you. Hey, let me, let me start by setting stage, okay? And then I got some questions for you all. And you know, the questions I sent off to you guys, I've decided to change them last minute. So you have no awareness of any of the questions I'm going to ask. Get ready. Um, I'm just kidding. Uh, but let me just start by giving a little context to the built environment. Okay. We, I think most people know, but I feel like I would just articulate some things that maybe help level set us first. The built environment globally accounts for about 40% of the CO2 emissions. Some of it's embodied, but most of it comes out of the operational emissions of built, you know, operating buildings, the energy and other, uh, other ways that uh, greenhouse gases kind of get emitted from the built environment. 40%, that's a big number, a big number, and it, it's, it's pretty massive. In 2020, a UN report on the built environment noted, and I, I find this really pretty important, that we have got to have a direct building CO2 emission need to be at about half the level by 2030 to actually get to almost zero by 2050. I mean, that's a, that's a pretty monumental lift, right? You're gonna take half of it out in less than 10 years to even be on track at solving the big challenge that we have around climate. As we embark on this new era of climate leadership, the other challenge we have, and I think the speakers before noted this, but let me see if I can summarize it in my own words. I mean, we have these three overlapping crises that, that amplify one another. We clearly have a climate crisis. We have an equity crisis, and we have an affordability crisis. You know, we, we're not going to be able to solve for one without addressing all. We're not gonna be able to create a balance between the built and the natural environment at scale unless we simultaneously solve for all three of these crises. So the work that we had and have at hand isn't just about taking carbon out of the built environment. We've got to do it in a just way. We've got to do it in a way that includes all. And that's why I'm so looking forward uh, to uh, speaking from each of you or, or asking each of you your perspective on this particular topic. So, um, you know, with, with, with that, um, I'd like to maybe start with Patience, if, if that's okay, and then I'll, I'll go to you, Deepa, in a moment. So, hey, Patience, can you, look, here's a question for you. What brought you personally to the built environment focus that you have, and what does your organization do, and how are you and your your team focused right now? Well, thank you, Ash, for that foundation. Uh, I will start off by saying that the most recent intergovernmental 
uh, panel on climate change actually reminds us in a report that the ability for us to really mitigate the impact of climate change is closing in in terms of the window of opportunity for us to advance that work. And that's why I'm really excited to be here today and be part of this movement that's thinking of how do we reduce emissions in buildings and in the built environment. And I'll talk briefly about my personal story down the road. I do wanna start off by telling you about who the Housing Development Consortium is. Because at our core, we are working across multiple stakeholders across the King County region to think about how we are providing housing for all people. We're rethinking how we're providing housing for all people. And the work of our association, and this is really now embedded in our strategic plan, which is a 2022 to 2025 strategic plan is squarely in the nexus of the three intersecting crises that you highlight. The crisis of affordable housing, the racial equity crisis that has been persistent for so long, and the climate change crisis. As such, we've gotten to a place where we don't believe in this perceived notion of the climate goals being in conflict with housing goals. And we're trying to work as a collective association to develop strategies around that. And we're doing a lot of that work in three big ways that I do want to illuminate on. The first one being we are advocating. We're advocating for policies and programs that uh, really ensure that we can make safe, healthy, and affordable homes a reality for all people, especially those who are 80% area medium and below. So those are the low income households. And we're making sure that's happening in climate resilient built environment communities, because that's the best way we can address these intersecting crises. And then number two, we are a broker of cross sector partnerships. We're bringing our housing expertise and inviting partner organizations with the expertise around energy efficiency, the engineering partners who are within our own association to help create affordable housing solutions that are also sustainable at the same time. And then third, we are a convener. We have a diverse membership of more than 190 member organizations that range from nonprofit affordable housing developers to community-based organizations, public agencies, around this shared vision of ensuring that all low-income households do have access to safe, healthy, and affordable homes. In terms of how I got into this work or what brought my personal focus to the built environment, it's really my personal story of having grown up in a small country, in a village in Zimbabwe, Southern Africa, and having felt the persistent impact of the brunt of climate change on frontline communities, which is what I see my community as. We had persistent uh, droughts that were really affecting our community and now moving here, seeing the similar challenges in the immigrant communities and my intersecting identity with a lot of the people who are first and most impacted by climate uh, change really resonated with me to continue the advocacy around environmental justice. In particular, looking at the communities that I, that I organized here within our community, the immigrant communities within One America, the labor union uh, workers who are low wage uh, service providers, and now in the affordable housing sector, a lot of those communities are reflected uh, being number one, low income, Number two, Black, Indigenous, people of color communities, and that's who is first and foremost impacted. And that's why my, our commitment as an association is that as we move forward towards an equitable and sustainable future, we're really advancing where we know the burden is most and the burden is most for folks who are in the front lines of climate change impacts. And we think we can do that by making sure that the housing that's being provided for them is not only affordable, but it's also healthy. Uh, it's also safe for them to be able to live long term as we move towards the future. That is just absolutely amazing. I, you know, by the way, 
I also love that right at the end there, you added healthy because I do think that sometimes there's this kind of misnomer that comes from deeply weatherizing houses and therefore, you know, making them so uh, resistant to air moving inside and outside that sometimes people think that if you're making affordable houses, sustainable, decarbonizing, somehow you're actually causing other things to happen that may not be good for the occupants. So I, I, love, I love that you're thinking about that patient and that you're laying that out. Um, hey, what, what, is the, what is the, how do we see your organization if we want to learn more? What, what do we do? We can go to our website, it's the Housing Development Consortium of Seattle King County. Uh, and we are always glad to partner with folks from across sectors and collectively uh, be th thought leaders in terms of how we as an affordable housing sector can be a partner in the climate movement. Yeah, I, I think your voice in many, many, many rooms is needed. So thank, thank you. and looking forward to asking you some additional kind of follow-up questions. Hey, Deepa, how are you? I'm doing well, and yeah, just feeling super pumped up from from hearing uh, everything that Patience was just sharing. No kidding, geez, you know, I have I, I only had one cup of coffee today, but these <laughs> speakers are just getting me all jazzed up. So uh, I know we know a little bit about your organization since your partners shared, but <laughs> let's uh, let let me just pose the same question: What personally brought you, and and what your role in the organization at Climate Solutions would be wonderful to hear about, please. Yeah, thank you. Yes, I yeah. So everyone, I know that you've all heard a lot about climate solutions already, and I'm very thrilled to be part of such a great organization. Um, just to set a little bit of context about my work um, within the climate solutions team. So our policy team here in Washington um, works to advance policies that broadly help us get to um, our statewide requirement of reducing our greenhouse gas emissions 95 percent from 1990 levels by the year 2045. Um, I'm sorry, by the year 2050. Um, so, you know, our policy team here, I have fantastic colleagues that are working on um, climate mitigation efforts around transportation, land use, electricity, while my focus since I joined the team uh, has been policies that get us to this notion of clean, safe, all electric buildings. Um, and, you know, we'll need a wide range of complementary policies to really help us get there. So that includes work at the local level with cities and counties, um, work at the state legislature and work at the state regulatory levels where those policies are implemented. Um, so I think we'll, we'll get a chance later to, to talk a little bit more about what that work looks like, but I'll tell you a little about myself as well and, and the perspective I bring to this. Um, I joined our policy team in July 2020, so I'm still fairly new. Um, and I really came to this work with an environmental justice perspective. Um, on a personal note, personal note, I was born and raised in Seattle, in, in West Seattle, um, but to parents who moved here from India. So I have sort of this dual you know, perspective of, of a lot of the family that I have back in a country that is facing even more severe climate impacts in a lot of ways. We just have had some horrible heat that affected uh, most of the South Asian subcontinent. Um, and, uh, and then seeing those impacts here um, in the place where I grew up and uh, love as well. Um, and so, yes, coming from exactly what you were saying about the health perspective um, and the environmental justice and, and environmental racism perspective to, to how we should see um, how climate change impacts us. Um, and I'll confess that, you know, before joining Climate Solutions, I, I've worked in climate for a long time, but it's only in the past few years that this conversation around building electrification and building decarbonization has really sort of gotten a lot more attention. And a lot of these issues were really new to me as well, um, particularly those health impacts. Um, you know, we, we are learning about the dangers of burning gas indoors um, from cooking appliances. Uh, we're learning that they create indoor air pollution, which is largely unregulated, and that children that are growing up in these homes are 42% more likely to develop asthma symptoms. Um, you know, we, we are, uh, this, this part isn't new, but we're seeing, um, you know, the risks that running uh, gas through highly pressurized pipelines, you know, to our homes can have um, on leaks and fires. So really thinking about how um, the buildings that we live in can be safer and cleaner is, is crucial. And I just want to note too the impact that um, the pandemic has had, and both on on making these dangers um, more potent, and also on really highlighting the injustices and inequities between frontline communities who are facing the disproportionate burden. Um, you know, we've seen that Black, Latinx, Indigenous, and Asian folks and low-income folks have borne a greater burden of death and illness from COVID, and those 
risks are exacerbated by exposure to air pollution, um, which are also borne uh, disproportionately by those communities. Um, so we really need to be thinking about all of these topics together um, and holistically. Um, I think some of the things that are exciting about this work in buildings are that, you know, we're not only, by, by moving towards all electric buildings, we're not only helping to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions from fossil fuels, but we're also, to your point, Ash, about weatherization and, and um, adaptation, we're hopefully making more resilient homes uh, to help protect the folks who, who will live in those homes um, from, you know, heat, smoke, um, and, and all of those other things that we're seeing more and more of here in the Pacific Northwest. So those are some of the perspectives that I'm bringing to this. Yeah, that's wonderful. Yeah, it's so interesting. You know, the three of us, I, I just wanna, I wanna chime in and let you know that I was born in Palestine and it's interesting that the things that we saw overseas have inspired some of the work that we do. Uh, I used to go to the rooftop of, you know, God rest her soul, my, my grandparents' house, and they had a thermal storage system with these makeshift thermal storage panels. And that actually inspired me to want to be an engineer and want to focus in energy. So isn't it interesting the way our live stories kind of got us to where we are in different, different ways? Um, and and I and again, you know, I do think it's a really important point that Deepa, you're making and patience you're making. I mean, if we look back at what happened during uh, the pandemic, you know, we recognize just how vulnerable we are as people, particularly those of us that have the least. And yet, um, you know, that virus, that little virus, is was such a big issue as as everyone knows. But now imagining the, the massive, massive impact of climate change and what that would do to all people globally, again, should, should cause really an amplification on this topic, particularly to our overall health and well-being and long-term resiliency as humans, I think. You know. um, so thank you for sharing both the connection in the built environment, but I love that you're both kind of connected to the wellness and, and health issues related to these topics. Hey, Deepa, just a, a, a quick, a quick follow-up for you. Um, you know, when we talk about sustainability in the built environment, decarbonizing the built environment, electrifying the built, I, 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 as a geek, I think I know what that means. Um, um, but I'm curious, could you, could you give us a little bit more practical sense of when we say electrify or decarbonize the built environment? What, like, what does that mean? Yeah, yeah, great question. Um, uh, so I'll start with, you know, putting a finer point on, on the reasons why we need to be moving off of fossil fuels in our buildings. Um, in Washington, buildings are the fastest growing source of carbon emissions. Um, and with the passage of our Clean Energy Transformation Act, or CETA, in 2019, we are on a, a path to achieving 100% clean electricity by 2045. Um, Washington already has one of the cleanest electric grids in the country. So it's really, you know, evident that what we need to be moving towards now is getting away from the direct use of fossil fuels like gas. Um, gas is typically used either for heating or cooling through furnaces and air conditioners, also for cooking um, and for powering you know, washers and dryers. Uh, basically all those different needs um, are our water heating as well. And the good news is that there are um, options to shift all of that um, in, in our residential and our commercial buildings uh, to being powered directly by electricity. Um, and you know, the technology is there, um, electric heat pumps, uh, which uh, can be used for you know, heating our spaces um, and also for water heating. They also provide cooling. So you know, as we experienced with the heat dome last year, um, we, we were all learning about how few people in, in Washington actually have air conditioning in their homes. Um, so as we're you know, moving towards heat pumps, that is going to be an increased protection that we'll see. These technologies you know, work across the state in different climate zones. Um, they are increasingly cost effective, actually for, you know, a new single family home in Washington, there are cost savings when you're building without gas, um, the average homeowner will save $4,200 over 15 years with an all electric home. Um, you know, this uh, work has the opportunity to create jobs and uh, to spur the clean energy economy. Um, so, so those are, so those are some of the exciting sort of practical sides of this in terms of what it looks like to, to make your home all electric. Um, yeah. And just to, to touch on the policy side of it a little bit, um, you know, we're seeing a lot of movement around the country and in Washington to, to advance policies that, that help us get there. 
Um, so Vita talked about the amazing development from just a couple of weeks ago when the Washington State Building Code Council passed the strongest energy code in the country that requires heat pumps for space and water heating in new commercial and large multifamily buildings that are four stories or over. Um, that was a huge win. Uh, Patience and I both worked very hard on that. So thank you so much, Patience, for your advocacy there. Um, and that work also would not have happened without a lot of uh, lead up work um, from local jurisdictions in Washington, because since uh, early 2021, cities of Seattle, Shoreline, Bellingham, Tacoma, and Olympia have all passed policies that begin this transition off of gas in new buildings, um, including some of their own versions of advanced clean commercial energy code. And then one more thing I want to highlight is, um, you know, Deputy Nationally Deputy National and Climate Advisor um, Ali Zaidi also spoke about the National Building Performance Standards Coalition. Um, both the state of Washington and the city of Seattle are originating members of that coalition, and Seattle is currently working on developing a carbon-based building performance standard um, that would reduce emissions from commercial and multifamily buildings over 20,000 square feet. So you can see there's a lot of exciting policy work happening, and, uh, and there's, of course, still a long way to go. Yeah, that's fantastic. By the way, you know, on the energy code upgrade, um, as you know, you know, Caroline Traub, who's a principal engineer at McKinstry, actually sits on the codes committee, and she, 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 and and m m m many, many, you, you, and many others had to work very, very diligently to get uh, that code passed. So, thank you for your efforts on that, uh, on that particular code passage. That was great. Hey, patients, you know, we, we already have a challenge around just having affordable housing need near most metropolitan cities. I mean, workforce housing is a, a challenge all by itself. And we, we know what's going on in Seattle. I mean, I'm, I'm stunned. You know, I'm, I'm stunned. I've lived in this area for 30 years and can't believe the price of houses nowadays. And, and, um, and I think, I mean, I'm actually not, maybe you can help us first with how, how many affordable homes are we short? And then maybe as you're doing that, could you share with us a little bit more detail about the kind of policies we need to pass to ensure that we're bringing sustainability and decarbonization solutions to uh, affordable housing uh, in Seattle? And then maybe those affect even what goes on nationally. Could you, could you yeah. share with us some of your thoughts there, please? Well, thank you for that question, Ash. I will say that as of 2020, uh, so that's a few years ago, we are facing a sh shortage of a quarter billion homes for people earning less than half of the area median income. Wow. That number has likely gone up because we have not done recent analysis. Uh, so it will continue to grow as the housing market surges, uh, causing rental prices to increase exponentially and really exacerbating our state's homelessness crisis that we continue to be in. But while that increase in demand and need for housing could be a justifiable reason as to why an association like HTC would not support energy code changes, we actually argue as an association that it is precisely because of the increased need that we need to be at the table supporting that new affordable multifamily housing that's being built is really resilient homes for a sustainable future. Uh, some of the technologies that Deepa was expanding on earlier, we encourage the use of those. We want to make sure that we're reducing pollution, we're reducing the ongoing energy cost for low income households, uh, and we're also mitigating the near-term and long-term effects of climate change. I pause there to say, to say something that is, I think, of, of essence for us to be aware of in terms of the nuance, the changes in energy codes uh, and the changes in any regulatory requirements do come with cost for affordable housing providers. And that's an area of both tension and opportunity that we are working on. And I'm hoping we can spend time and a few other questions talking a little bit about strategies there and how to be partners. But long-term, the policies that we really need to be supporting is looking at building affordable multifamily housing projects, clean and resilient from the onset. And that's where we are now. And we're excited about the recent adoption by the Building Council of the Strongest Energy Code. 
uh, which I think is really a step in the best right direction, because that's the best way that we can prioritize frontline staff, frontline communities to really reduce the disproportionate burden that they bear of pollution, that they bear of climate change. And now we have robust energy code changes both at local and the state level, which we have supported. I think we have opportunity to expand some of the local implementation work uh, for different jurisdictions at the local level here in the region. Because if we are doing so, we're making sure that the benefits of energy efficiency are being distributed to these communities that we know to be best and most impacted. I will say that our members within HDC are actually leading the charge in building sustainably so far. We do have an exemplary building task force that has been working hard over the years in defining um, early integrative design guidelines for our members in defining some performance standards for existing buildings. So it's been work for some time that we have supported both in practice, but also in policy. We're also looking at uh, other parts of the country where this is being done in terms of policies. And essentially, as the secretary was saying earlier, the work has to be in building code changes, in energy code changes, but it's also in the building performance standards work. And we're seeing some work in California, we're seeing work in New York, and I'll talk a little bit more about the work that we are doing as Housing Development Consortium here locally in Seattle to advance our building performance standards that are supportive of affordable housing. I, you know, that's really wonderful. Here, here's the challenge we've got, I, and, I, and I knew it. We, we needed an hour for this awesome panel. And we, we've got just a few minutes left. So here's what, here's, what, here's what I would like to do. I was gonna ask you all a big question about affordability. I'm really curious to hear a patient's view on that. I don't think we're gonna be able to do that. I just, maybe I'll make a quick statement on it to say that McKinstry in the last several years um, has been working on this affordability topic, particularly in the commercial built environment. In Spokane, Washington, we, we, we developed as the real estate developer and then we built and now operate, leased out a uh, cross laminated timber, 160,000 square foot, building that's actually heading to be zero energy, zero carbon. We did that zero energy, zero carbon, zero cost premium. So I think that there are ways to do it. I think that there are ways that are challenging and not going to be easy to make affordability uh, of, the, of decarbonizing the built environment. But I, I think that now that our brains are focused on this topic collectively, the next job will be to make sure that we can get it accessible and affordable for all. And I know there's a big set of questions there that I was going to get into, but for the sake of time, I'm going to just ask the following and I'll let you go first, patients. Um, just 30 seconds, sorry, but any quick closing remarks to include 10, 15 years, anything you'd like to say about where you think we're heading? Well, Ash, 10 years from now is 2032. That correct? That's uh, so, right. I, yeah. So we have achieved and exceeded our goal of zero carbon buildings well before 2031. Uh, we are a state that is filled with sustainable, energy neutral buildings, mm -hmm. abundant, and affordable housing for all people. Mm -hmm. And that's housing that they can really truly afford, it's safe, it's healthy, and it's supporting their livelihood. And, and, and I love that. And I want to be on your team to get that done. So thank you. Can I add one last thing? Yes. We have also re reformed our zoning policies and ended exclusionary zoning because we do need density. And it is, a, it is a part of the conversation of how we do reduce emissions in our buildings. I love that. Actually, excellent, excellent point there. Deepa, your thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, thank you, Patience, for, for bringing in that that land use part of, uh, and zoning part of it, too. I think that's also super crucial. Yeah, I, you know, I know we don't have a ton of time left. I'll just add in um, that, you know, a lot of the policies and uh, and strategies we've been talking about are specifically around new construction and to Patience's point about how much new affordable housing we need. That's that's really crucial to make sure all of that is as clean and safe and um, and decarbonized as possible. The next big challenge is also going to be our existing buildings, which are, of course, the majority of the buildings that we have. 
Um, so it's going to be crucial that as we're passing policies like a building performance standard, which set in place requirements, that we're also passing complementary policies that help provide financial support to help um, to help those building owners and building tenants um, for our existing buildings where, where you know, there are going to be costs. So one of Climate Solutions' top priorities is going to be to advocate to the state legislature for a program that directs money to um, low-income communities to retrofit existing low-income housing. Exist addressing our existing homes is crucial, and this is a place where we really need to make funding um, a priority to make sure that we are making this transition equitably and that we're not putting the burden on um, the low-income tenants um, of, those, of those units. Deepa and patience, I, I've got to tell you, if, if, if any... But, if anybody thought that what you shared was not both inspiring and well thought, um, they would have to take words up with me. Thank you so much. Uh, you're both really absolutely fantastic. You know, uh, we need collective and inspired action and we need leaders just like you. And um, I, I really appreciate everything that you have shared today. And I really do wish we had more time together. But in the meanwhile, thank you and onwards, and I'd like to turn it over back to Stephanie. Stephanie, are you there? Yep, there you are. Stephanie, uh, you wanna wrap us up here? Yeah, I mean, like I said, you and I are old hands at this. So we've uh, we've been around the virtual event block from the very beginning. So this, is, this has been really great. And thanks to you for um, being part of our event and moderating this awesome panel. Way to go and cutting it short. That's really hard as the moderator. So uh, but we appreciate wrapping on time. Um, I want to thank everyone for joining, for joining us today and tuning in in the middle of the day. Um, there's no greater compliment uh, to us and um, in you taking the time to be interested in the work that Climate Solutions is doing and to support our work. I'd like to thank all of our speakers, Representative Jaipal, uh, Deputy Advisor Zaidi, uh, Patience, Deepa for sharing your time and insights to Jackie and Greg and Ash and Garab and Sabitha. Thank you also for your contributions today. Um, I wanna thank our elected officials who took the time to join as well as our coalition partners and all of the supporters who send emails and send text messages and respond and write letters and all of this work that we do is uh, just not possible without your support um, for climate and taking action on climate. I'd like to thank our producer, Edward Wolcher, for making this event seem so easy. And uh, without you, we definitely would be sweating a bit more and scrambling a whole lot more. So a uh, big thanks for um, your support in producing our event. And um, would also like to thank our sponsors again for um, helping to make these events possible. And just as a reminder, today's moment of event is a fundraiser. It's a part of our month long fundraising campaign that ends at the end of May. And if you haven't had the chance to donate, you can do that right now at climatesolutions.org forward slash give. Again, thanks for joining. We are so happy and proud to put these events on. Uh, we'll work hard at getting uh, more speakers and more interesting things that work on uh, about climate. And um, we'll send the recording out after the show. Thanks for tuning in. Bye.